Welcome to Why This Universe. Today's episode is going to be a bit more candid than usual. Dan and I talk about how the scene of dark matter research has changed over the last few years. Are wimps less popular than they used to be? What left field theories have taken their place? If you want a primer on dark matter, you can listen to episode one of our podcast. That's right, dark matter has always been a core topic here. But keep listening today to get the inside scoop on where dark matter researchers are turning their attention to these days. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. I'm Shalma Wegsman. And I'm Dan Hooper. Hey, Dan. So I recently saw a tweet by someone in the dark matter research community saying essentially that wimps are out and black holes are the new favorite dark matter candidate of the times. And as you know, it's been over two years now since I left academic research. But back in grad school, when I was doing dark matter research, it felt like wimps or these weakly interacting massive particles. um, It felt like those were the standard by far for dark matter candidates. So I was wondering if you've really noticed this big of a shift in the dark matter world in the past few years, given that you are very inside of it. Yeah, I mean, I think there has been a, you know, pretty significant shift in how people, active researchers, that is, are thinking about dark matter. On social media, you might also get the impression that there are a lot of people working on on physics who maybe are skeptical of dark matter, but that's not true. Like that's an extremely small fraction, but the fraction of papers, I should say that are getting written about different candidates for what the dark matter might be have changed a lot. So the most popular longstanding class of candidates are are what we call wimps. And actually the the word wimp has meant different things over different time. But to these days, what people mean is some sort of kind of heavy particle that was abundantly produced in the early universe. As the universe expanded and cooled, most of those particles were destroyed. And the small remnant that was left behind makes up the dark matter. That's the sort of picture. You know, 30 years ago, when people talked about WIMPs, they were usually talking about particles that came in supersymmetric theories called neutralinos. But really, WIMPs are broader than that. WIMPs could be a lot of different kinds of particles and a lot of different kinds of theories, as long as they have kind of these sort of properties. And also 30 years ago, we didn't have any particularly good ways of looking for wimps. Like we weren't, our experiments that looked for wimps weren't very sensitive. And that has really changed over that time. We built these underground detectors, what we call direct detection experiments. And we tried to look for indications that wimps were smashing into those detectors, um, even occasionally. And, you know, it used to be that these detectors were things you could like little hold in your palm of your hand, you know, and and now they're things that take a large room and they just keep getting bigger and better and more powerful. The world leading ones right now use liquid xenon as their target, which has a bunch of nice features for dark matter detection. And they're, you know, buried, you know, something like a mile or so underground Super, super carefully instrumented, really sophisticated electronics. And they're, you know, millions of times more sensitive than the old detectors. And they still haven't seen any WIMPs. So if you took all the WIMPs that people like me were writing about 20 years ago, you know, probably most of those are ruled out now. Not all of them. There are lots of them that are still in good shape, but like a lot of them are ruled out. Maybe to give people like a little bit of intuition yeah. about like why wimps would be a front runner candidate for so long, right? So just to summarize again, right? So what is dark matter? We obviously don't know what it is in terms of what the particle that makes it up, what anything about that particle, what its properties are, but we know that it has to be something that interacts with gravity, yep. that has some hand in, in the formation of our galaxies and, mm-hmm. and keeping those galaxies stuck together and everything. So we feel its effects from gravity, but we have not observed any other interactions, say with light, with the electromagnetic field, with the strong force or the weak force. With the possible exception of the galactic center gamma ray excess, but we won't talk about with that the pos- today. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
So given all those things, it kind of makes sense that you would propose a weekly interacting, like a very rarely interacting massive particle, right? Like a particle with mass that interacts with gravity in our traditional ways. Exactly. That like doesn't, that literally just weekly interacts in all the other ways, right? That's kind of the intuition behind the wimp. And furthermore, if, if you have a kind of particle that's produced abundantly in the early universe, if you don't give it those weak interactions, it will emerge from the Big Bang with a huge abundance, way more than there is dark mm. matter in our universe. So you have to give it those weak interactions to help get rid of most of it, like what we, through the process of WIMP annihilation. So two WIMPs collide, normal matter comes out. You, you need those interactions or you'll end up with way too much dark matter it, it, you know, under these assumptions. So that's another reason to expect these particles will interact at a you know, non-negligible but still feeble way. Right. Otherwise, you'd say, you know, why does it have to interact at all? Right. And also, if, if two WIMPs have a process by which they can annihilate into ordinary matter, then there will also be processes where those WIMPs can scatter off of things like nuclei. Um, it's not the same process, but one kind of implies the other. So um, that gives us another way to look for them too. And you could also kind of turn that logic around and you can say, well, if WIMPs can collide and annihilate into ordinary particles, then you could collide ordinary particles together and create WIMPs. So you could maybe at the Large Hadron Collider, for example, try to produce and detect the dark matter particles that you've created yourself in the lab. Um, so far, that hasn't happened, of course. Right. Okay. So that's kind of why these guys were the front runners for the dark matter candidate for so long. Yep. And you're, you know, we're not on here to say like some massive change has just happened that no, would it's shift been everyone slow. away from WIMPs. It's been a slow process of searching more of the parameter space and, you know, limiting the potential properties of these WIMPs and everything. But we were chatting a bit about how just the day to day what people are choosing to work on has gradually been shifting away from WIMPs. Mm -hmm. So that's what we wanted to talk about. Exactly. So, but you know, like you said, it's been going on for a while. Um, my last popular physics book was At the Edge of Time, and that was published, I think, in 2019. And that book had at least a big chapter about how we're thinking differently about dark matter now. And uh, a big theme of that is is not that wimps are ruled out or that no one thinks wimps are interesting. That that's not true, but that um, the like slice of the to pieces of the pie and how they're divided into our attention. It used to be you know seventy percent of that pie was wimps and thirty percent was other <laughs> stuff. Now you know maybe it's thirty percent are wimps and seventy percent are other stuff. Something like that. That's a big shift, actually. It is. And it's happened over, I don't know, 10-ish years or something. Mm -hmm. You know, It's a pretty big shift, though. Yeah. You notice it at the dark matter meetings. Mm, so the dark matter meetings used to be... All wimps. Or not all. All, but all, all about wimp heavy. All about wimps. Wimp heavy talks. Like a lot, you'll just see a lot of talks about searching for wimps in all these different ways, maybe direct detection, indirect detection, but kind of all around wimps. And now when you go to the dark matter talks... Um, and conferences, what do you hear? Well, you hear, you know, a little bit about WIMPs, but you hear a lot about other kinds of uh, dark matter candidates. So let's like maybe go through those like one at mm -hmm. a time. Um, another very popular candidate, and it's been popular for a long time, but I would say it's been kind of a, you know, second to WIMPs are particles called axions. Um, Shalma, you worked on axions in grad mm -hmm. school, for example. In grad school, yeah. um, I've done a little bit of work on axions too, although it's certainly not my specialty. But um, axions are really different. They're, they were introduced in the late '70s um, in a in a kind of class of models that was designed to solve something called the strong CP problem or strong char char charge parity problem. Basically, what it boils down to is like. The structure of the standard model suggests that that uh, the uh, neutron should have a big electric dipole moment, and that means it should like respond to magnetic fields. And best we can tell, it doesn't. Okay, and um, there's a free parameter in the standard model that sets how much this interaction should be, and you could set it to anything, um, but like it's 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 an angle, so it can only be between 
you know, zero and I forget if it's pi or two pi, but something like that in terms of angle. And it's smaller but for measurements we know than 10 to the minus 10. So it's a very specific number. It's very, very small. And we don't have any good reason to think why it would be that small. So people wanted an explanation. And Helen Quinn and uh, Roberto Pecci proposed an explanation. It's a new model where that, that number is kind of driven to zero through the interactions of some other particles that exist. And then shortly after that, Steven Weinberg and uh, Frank Wilczek both independently said, in that class of theories, there will be this particle that Frank Wilczek named the axion, and that that thing should exist. And um, people years later, or at least sometime later, started thinking maybe that particle could be the dark matter. It's very different from WIMPs. It wasn't abundantly produced in the early universe. It is so feebly interacting that the hot Big Bang didn't, wouldn't even make much of it. It's produced through a couple of kind of weird mechanisms in smaller abundances. Like there's something called the misalignment mechanism where the particles that are in these theories start out in a certain state. And then as time goes on, they move into another state and that energy has to go somewhere and that energy turns out to go into the production of a bunch of axions. Also, you end up with these weird things called topological defects that form in these theories. These aren't particles. They're not fields, but they're like ways that fields get tangled up in space. And those things are unstable. And as they fall apart and disappear, their energy goes into ax production of axions. So you make axions in really different ways than you make webs, not just in collisions of particles. Um, you know, you make them in these other more exotic ways. Turns out you can make the right amount of dark matter this way. The axions would be really, really light, probably like 10 to the minus five electron volts, which I guess makes them, you know, uh, 10 to the minus 11 times as heavy as an electron. So very, very, very light particles, the lightest particles we would know of, except for the perfectly massless photon and gluon. And they're also really hard to detect because they interact so, so feebly, like way more feebly than WIMPs. But people have clever ways to do it um, using various powerful magnets that try to convert axions that come from the cosmos into light that we can detect. And so far, we haven't seen anything, but the experiments are progressing. Um, at Fermilab, where I used to work, we have uh, a bunch of people working on axions in a bunch of other places, too. And uh, the hope is we'll be able to explore some of the most promising, you know, examples of axion models in the years ahead. So axions are more popular now than they were 20 years ago. Um, but they aren't even, even today, they're not a particularly big piece of that pie. They're, you know, they've mm -hmm. got their, I don't know, 15% or something. I'm going to add, <laughs> add up these numbers and see if I can make this work over the course of the <laughs> podcast. Um. Another thing that, that like 20 years ago, almost nobody was working on in terms of dark matter, but now lots and lots of people are, including myself, is the possibility that the dark matter could be made of black holes that originated in the Big Bang, primordial black holes. It might seem like kind of, you know, smashing two concepts together to say, oh, what if black holes could be dark matter? But if you think about it, maybe it makes sense, right? Like black holes, you can't see them. They're called black because no light can escape them. So they wouldn't interact with like our um, electromagnetic fields, for example. And they do interact with gravity, right? So they kind of do fit the bill a bit. Yeah, they have all the basic features you want in a dark matter candidate. You know, um, they, 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 would, they would check all those boxes. So we have some pretty good ways to look for black holes um, already. Um, for, like the really big black holes, like um, heavier than like hundreds of solar masses, so hundreds of times the mass of the sun, they, if they existed early on in our universe's history, would have, like they would have accreted matter onto them and created a bunch of radiation and that would have interfered and it was kind of screwed up like things like the cosmic background that we observe so precisely. So there couldn't have been very many at the, in that mass range. As you go to lower masses, like from like, I don't know, 10 to the minus 15 or so solar masses, which is about 10 to the 16 kilograms and up, 
We can look for those through a process called gravitational microlensing. This is essentially light from an object being deflected by a black hole and like uh, causing that, that luminous object to get focused towards your telescope. So it'll look brighter for a while. We don't see this happening very often. So we can put upper limits on how many black holes there are of different masses. And like over most of this mass range, we can say that probably less than a few percent of the dark matter could be black holes. You know, there could still be some, but you know, not, not most of it. And then there's this really interesting window between about 10 to the 15 and 10 to the 16 kilograms or so. This is kind of like a, a big asteroid, something like that in terms of mass. And we don't really have any good constraints on black holes there. So all the dark matter could consist of black holes in like that sort of range. Um, we call it the, you know, that, that's, the, that's the window where, where all the dark matter could be made of black holes. And then as you go to lower masses still, this is where black holes are small enough and hot enough that they'll actually radiate through Hawking evaporation. And you can look for the particles that they would make. Um, and, you know, we're pretty strong constraints on black holes lighter than that. So there's really this one sweet spot of masses where maybe the dark matter is made of black holes. You might ask then, like, so if you have black holes in this mass range, like, where did they come from? And that's, a, it turns out to be a complicated question, but we think in the in the very early universe, our universe expanded like in a burst that we call cosmic inflation early on. And depending on your the precise details of your model of inflation, your universe when you're done is left with certain kind of density variations or perturbations. And um, the ones we observe, the ones on really big, you know, macroscopic scales, they are, you know, have a, a particular pattern. And if that pattern extends all the way down to small sizes, then we probably won't make many black holes. But if there's way more, way bigger density variations and small scales, some of those could have collapsed into these asteroid mass black holes. And, uh, you know, th 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 there are models you can write down where that would work. Now, why black holes are a lot more popular today than they used to be, I, I don't really know. I have a few guesses or theories about that. One is just as WIMPs become more tested and more explored, people working on dark matter are looking for new things to work on. I, I think that's probably why I'm writing papers on it now. Um, but also, like in experiments like LIGO and the Event Horizon Telescope and Nanograph, they're all seeing black holes in different ways. I, these aren't the kind of black holes that could make up dark matter. But, you know, if you spend a certain number of minutes a day thinking about black holes and you spend a certain number of minutes a day thinking about dark matter, it's a pretty good chance you're eventually going to think about black holes as dark matter. So, you know, that would be my guess. Right. And just for, for people who maybe don't realize, it's like scientists are kind of their own mini CEOs, right? If you're leading a research group, you kind of get to decide what you work on with some caveats if you need funding, right? Yeah. But it's not like there's some sort of entity that's telling people to spend more time thinking about black holes, right? This is like kind of organically the scientists working in dark matter are becoming more and more curious about black holes. Yeah, there are gentle incentives that you know impact what kind of stuff a lot of people work on. But no yeah, no one's like coming from the top saying, okay, you, you and you work on this and you, you <laughs> yeah. and you work on that. Like that that's not how it works. Um, like you mentioned funding, and if you're working on really unpopular ideas that, you know, your peers don't think are interesting, you might not, you might struggle to obtain funding. If you're a junior scientist, like somebody without a, a permanent job, mm -hmm. you are always worried about getting your next postdoc or whatever. And, and you might want to work on, you know, I ideas that people find interesting. So they'll want to hire you. So like, that's an incentive. And like, you know, people are worried about like how often their papers get cited and if their papers get up, get published in like prestigious journals and stuff like this. And, you know, they, you, you know, th those things provide some incentives. But I'd argue that if you're working on something that nobody thinks is interesting, you, you're probably not pursuing the right stuff anyway. You mm -hmm. know, usually, not always, but usually. <laughs> 
And then I want to ask, I mean, black holes and dark matter sounds kind of cool, but would it have any actual implications about just the universe being different than we think if there are all these black holes around? Well, it would tell us a lot about inflation, right? So if if uh, if if our universe started out after inflation in a state where there's all these big density variations on these small scales, I mean, that tells us a lot about how inflation played out. Um, so that would be really, really big deal. But like like in the, the contemporary universe, I don't think these black holes would frankly do a lot. Um, these are the sorts of black holes that would be passing through our solar system and like we'd basically never notice. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're really small, you know, they're, um, I think we once said on our show that you can have a black hole with the mass of an asteroid pass right through the earth and no one would notice. Right. That's right. These sorts of black holes that we're talking about, they'd be so small, like they would travel through the solar system all the time and do almost nothing. Um, like you could imagine one, like deflecting the orbit of something gently, if you were to observe things precisely enough, but it'd be hard to do. And uh, they could travel like basically through solid objects like the Earth and nothing would ever happen. Like we're talking about things with a Schwarzschild radius on, in the ballpark of like something like nanometer scale, like really, really small. So um, like we're, we're talking about things that basically just don't interact with the world except through a gentle tug of gravity. And even if you did observe that gentle tug of gravity, it would be very hard to tell that it wasn't just a normal asteroid or something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, I, you could maybe then follow it up and look for that asteroid. And if you didn't see it, it you know, mm -hmm. whatever. But no, it would be, it's very hard to do. Very, very hard to do. Okay, so primordial black holes are getting more attention these days, maybe just because people are bored with wimps. Yeah, let's give them another 15% of the pie. All right, something like yeah, that. Yeah, okay. okay. So we got 15%. 30, 15, 15. So, it was 30% uh, WIMPs, 15% Axions. And then now 15% primordial black holes. By the way, this okay. is a super non-scientific. Uh, <laughs> I, I haven't actually it's gone out vibe. and measured anything. It's just yeah. the vibes. Just the vibes. <laughs> so another idea that's been popular over the years, at least to some degree, is that the dark matter could be made of what we call sterile neutrinos. So the standard model of particle physics has three kinds of neutrinos, the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And if there were a other particle that is, has the same kind of what we call intrinsic spin as a neutrino and that doesn't have any electric charge or other things like that, that particle would mix or oscillate into the standard model neutrinos, kind of allowing it to inherit a little bit of those neutrino interactions. And we call that kind of neutrino a sterile neutrino. So there are really good reasons to think sterile neutrinos in some way, shape, or form exist. Um, pretty much all of our theories that explain why the center model neutrinos have small amounts of mass, which we measure them to have, involve sterile neutrinos. But in most of those models, the sterile neutrinos are really heavy and they're short-lived and, and they don't really have anything to do with cosmology. But in some, you can write down some sterile neutrino models or some neutrino mass models where one or more of the sterile neutrinos is, is lighter, it could be really long lived, and um, they could make up the dark matter. Um, there's a complete, a, yet another way that you could make this kind of dark matter candidate in the early universe, and that's through the scattering of neutrinos and their oscillating or, or transforming from regular neutrino into sterile neutrino. Um, this was proposed back in the early 90s, and it turns out you can work this out and you can get the right abundance of, of dark matter that way. But as you turn up this degree of mixing and, and allowing you to make more of, the more of the sterile neutrinos this way, you also make the sterile neutrinos decay faster. Like that, that, the, that single parameter you know, kind of controls both of these things. And, well, you need to make sure that neutrinos are long-lived enough that they haven't disappeared from our universe yet because we have the same amount of dark matter in our universe as today as we did billions of years ago. So basically, they, they can't decay too fast. But also, some of these decays, it turns out, will cause the sterile neutrino to turn into a normal neutrino and a single photon. And when that happens, that single photon has exactly the same amount of energy every time, half of the mass of that original sterile neutrino. 
And that means this is going to produce a spectral line, a, 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 a spectral feature where all the photons have the same energy. And these are things that are pretty easy to look for compared to other sorts of astrophysical signals. So people have looked for these spectral lines. Um, like 10 years ago or something, there were some groups who said they found one and it was a very hot topic for a while. But um, as the dust settled, it seems that that line's probably not really there. Maybe we'll do an episode on that sometime. Um, but even regardless, like the constraints people have put on these uh, on sterile neutrinos from looking for the spectral lines have been pretty strong. And there's a pretty narrow range now of parameter space where the sterile neutrinos could make up the dark matter. Making things worse in that sort of parameter space of these models, the, the dark matter is not completely cold. Okay. So normally we, we write down dark matter candidates that are, are cold. And that means that they're, they're throughout cosmic history, they've been moving at speeds well below the speed of light. If dark matter is cold, you can calculate how these particles will clump together and how those clumps will merge and merge with bigger clumps eventually forming things like the halos of galaxies and of galaxy clusters. It turns out that the predictions for the distribution and abundance of those, those halos matches what we observe in our universe. So it seems that dark matter is pretty cold. It certainly isn't hot, but there's kind of a realm slightly in between where the dark matter could be a little bit warm and still be consistent with our observations. Which means by the way, moving like almost relativistic speeds. It, it probably means so as as the universe expands and cools, the dark matter cools too. So the question really is: When dark matter became the main component of our universe about fifty thousand years after the Big Bang, was it relativistic then? Okay, so um, cold dark matter is definitely not. Hot dark matter is yes. Warm dark matter is like maybe a little bit relativistic around 50,000 years. It'd be, it would be like non-relativistic now for sure. But, but you know, that, that was an important formative time in the formation of, of large-scale structure. So the kind, if you have dark matter that's a little bit warm, like these sterile neutrinos would be, then it, it turns out you'd get pretty much the same number of like the really big galaxies and galaxy clusters, but you would notice a absence or a relative absence compared to cold dark matter of the smallest galaxies. So in the last you know, couple of decades, astronomers and cosmologists have gotten really good at looking for small galaxies, uh, especially around the Milky Way, what we call satellite galaxies or dwarf galaxies of the Milky Way. Um, I think, you know, when I started grad school or something, there were like 10 of these things known. And now there are like 80 or something like this. If dark matter is cold, then there are probably something like 200 of these on the Milky Way. And we, we just haven't found them all yet because like we've deployed telescopes that can see certain parts of the sky, but not other parts of the sky, et cetera. So there are some parts of the sky we aren't that good at looking for, at dwarf, for dwarf, dwarf galaxies yet. Um, but like with the Rubin Observatory, we should detect like maybe another 150 or something. So like, you know, that's exciting. Um, but as we find more of these dwarf galaxies, the more strongly we constrain, can, can constrain how warm the dark matter might be. And some groups, I'm thinking of like the Dark Energy Survey Collaborations Group, you know, and the work by people like Ethan Nadler and stuff, they basically have found that you can rule out sterile neutrino dark matter um, from these considerations. Like, you know, I think there's a tiny little corner of parameter space that isn't ruled out in their paper, but, but basically ruling out almost all of it. But just like uh, something like a month ago or so, a different group, uh, mostly European uh, cosmologists, uh, make some different assumptions and some other analysis choices, and they find the constraints are a little weaker and that there's still is some room for sterile neutrino dark matter. Um, but one way or the other, I think, um, in the next, you know, in the next decade, and with with the Rubin Observatory. This is a, a very testable hypothesis. We can find out one way or the other whether sterile, well, whether dark matter is warm, and in turn whether the dark matter could be made up of sterile neutrinos. It's funny just how hard it is to rule out any option, yeah. right? Like you can rule it out, and then if you just tweak your assumption, your analysis can can show up just a slightly 
slightly different and then you allow like oh maybe it's possible if they have exactly this mass range right. or something and um the, you know you can move the goalposts in a lot of these theories right mm-hmm. um you know like well i would guess it's gonna have this mass and you test it and it's not there like well it could be a little heavier it could be a little heavier and you, you know you can play that game for a while um but there are a lot of theories that people just don't talk about at all anymore because you know they're they've been sufficiently tested that we've you know abandoned them um, and I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if sterile neutrinos enter that category in the kind of near future. Yeah. What are, what are some of those that we've ruled out completely that people don't talk about anymore? Yeah. Yeah. So like people way back in the day used to talk about, uh, particles that were essentially wimps, but that had the sort of interactions of a normal neutrino. Okay. So, um, uh, this could be either like literally a fourth kind of center bundle neutrino, or it could be a supersymmetric partner partner of one, like a snutrino. And like sometime in the like late nineties experiments got good enough to look for those. And no one talks about those anymore. They just don't, you know, they're not part of the story anymore. Okay. So despite the fact that you just said that the whole theory of sterile neutrinos might be thrown out mm-hmm. relatively soon, you're still seeing talks on this at conferences, right? Yeah, yeah, N- not a ton, but some, you know, five or ten percent, five or ten percent, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not sure what our pie heads up to right now. Okay, uh, we're at sixty-five to seventy percent, depending on what you gave the serial neutrinos. Yeah, yeah. Does that feel about accurate? Like there are about thirty percent covering topics that we haven't covered here. I think so. Yeah, it's about right. Um, you you definitely get like a lot of uh, talks kind of fall in the other category, you know, Uh, talks about kind of candidates that, you know, are are maybe a little weirder. They have some extra features. They're designed to solve some particular problem or something that like maybe not everyone's taking seriously or, or at least uh, not, not convinced as a real problem. Um, Like uh, there's something called the edges anomaly. And it's this, uh, I, I won't even get into it, but like, it, 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 if it were real, it would suggest that the dark matter is scattering with protons, like in the early, in the relatively early universe, and scattering with them a lot. And people cooked up a bunch of dark matter models to try to do this. Now, most people don't think the edges anomaly is real, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, it's kind of a, a small part of the pie. But like, I wouldn't be surprised if if a serious person is giving a talk on that at a dark matter conference like that, 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 that wouldn't be weird. Um, you know, but it's not 5%, you know, it's, it's, it's smaller than that. Okay. So candidly and putting you on the spot here, are there any ideas from that 30% miscellaneous category that have been catching your eye lately? Yeah. I really like a class of models that, um, I call hidden sector models. So in some ways this is kind of a variation of a wimp, but it's, but it's, different yeah we worked on these together when i was an undergrad we did yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um what well, yeah with um let's see sam witty and uh rebecca lean right yeah yeah i was setting um a cosmological constraint yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you did that part of the, the paper yeah basically what a hidden sector particle is 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 one that you know, it, it it has like weak like interactions like a WIMP does, but not to standard model particles, to something else. So maybe these particles can annihilate in the early universe at a WIMP like rate, but they're not annihilating it into standard model particles. They're in, they're annihilating into something else. And then those particles uh, decay sometime later, maybe a fraction of a second later, let's say. And um, this allows you to get the right abundance of your particles in the early universe in the same way WIMPs can, but it also allows you to explain why you haven't seen them in underground detectors or at the Large Hadron Collider and so on. So, um, you know, this is kind of keeping all the best stuff of WIMPs while also being able to explain why you haven't seen them. Um, and, And to be honest, I think these would have been popular 20 years ago, except what are you going to say about them? Like, um, you can't point to an experiment that could look for them. So like what, what, what paper do you write about these? You could point it out, but no one would care because you're predicting something you can't test. And, you know, we were better at testing them now. So we, we're not, it's not hopeless to test them now. 
but um, but I think you know physicists like to work on things that they can think of a way to to test in the relatively near future. And these were not that twenty years ago, but maybe they are now. So, what piece of the pie is that? Eh, five or ten, similar to sterile neutrinos now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so this has been our dark matter vibe check. Yeah, it's it's fun to see things change. You know, if if a field goes this, you know, as long as I've been in the dark matter game without changing a lot, that would actually be really disappointing. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you yeah. But the the ideal case is you make like discoveries and learn what the dark matter is and it changes for those reasons but if that's not going to happen i would at least love to you know get a lot of our ideas tested even if they're ruled out you know a negative test still tells you something about the world and there have been a lot of those and i would say we know a lot more about dark matter now than we did then um and i hope in 20 more years we'll know a lot more still so I guess you could say science is working, you know, people adapt and change when the, the ideas aren't aren't panning out, you know? Go science. <laughs> Go science. <laughs> <laughs> Why This Universe is produced and edited by me, Shalma Wegsman, and our co-host is Dan Hooper. Dan is a professor of physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the director of the Wisconsin Ice Cube Particle Astrophysics Center. If you like our show and you want to support us, you can join us for as little as $3 a month on Patreon. There you can also get access to exclusive Ask Us Anything segments where you can directly ask Dan and I any of your questions on physics or whatever else. And to find that, just go to patreon.com slash whythisuniverse. As always, thanks for listening.